just wait in the hallway right after church and see if you can escape unharmed um, running up and down the hallway. Love these kids. Would you love these kids? And as they become teenagers and they start doing weird stuff, okay, um, would you love them? And let the parents parent them, right? And we love them. We set an example before them, and we, we can earn that spot to give correction when correction is needed. But, man, just love them. Don't, don't uh, try to force them into some mold you think they ought to fit in. Let's let the Holy Spirit have room to mold them and make them into what they need to be, right? And, I, uh, I, man, I, I'd love to see. Can't wait to see what God has for some of these children around here, for all of them. Hey, look in Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. And verses 3 through 9. Now, we've been doing on Sunday nights a series on relationships, uh, specifically the husband-wife relationship. Yeah, this is good. Um, but some of these principles apply to all those relationships. So let's do a review here. This, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. This is the seventh lesson. So let's look at the first six right quick. Anybody remember the first lesson? Expectations ruin relationships. That's right. Listen, when we as a, a spouse, begin to expect out of our spouse what only the Lord can do, we set ourselves up for failure. Look, our, our two most uh, basic emotional needs, security and significance, only the Lord can provide that to the fullest, right? So that's the one I need to learn to lead on. Listen, uh, ladies, your husband will not complete you. Sir, your wife cannot completely complete you. Only the Lord can do that. It's only in the Lord that I'm made perfectly whole, okay? Now, I need my spouse, and I do rely on my spouse for some things, but we can place unreasonable expectations on them, and we can sure ruin a relationship. The next one was providing a safe atmosphere in the home, that atmosphere where no matter what happens, my children, my, my wife, my husband, my parents, they love me. They may be a little upset, may be disappointed, may be frustrated, but they love me, we're in this thing for the long haul, uh, there is no such thing as a deal breaker, creating a safe atmosphere in the home. The third one was don't go with what? Don't go with your gut. Don't go with your Many times we make a decision and we can say, well, I, I, feel at, I feel at peace about this. Jonah felt at peace. When he was down in the bottom of the ship, man, he was sleeping so soundly in the storm that they had to go and wake him up. Hey, man, we're about to die. All right? He had made a wrong decision going directly opposite of the way that God would have him go, and yet he said, I feel at peace about this. Now, I understand the Bible says, let the, the peace of God rule and reign in your heart and all that. Here's what I said in that, that uh, lesson there. Before you go with your gut, before you go with your heart, well, I feel like my heart's going to do this. The heart is what? Yes, desperately wicked, it's deceitful above all things, so you can't just always go with your heart, your heart will lead you astray, uh, your gut will lead you astray, you know what's in your guts, right, okay, I rest my case, uh, you don't want to just always go with your gut, um, but we go with the word of God, that's where we go first, now yes, the Holy Spirit will lead us, but he'll never lead us contrary to the word, so always measure your decisions by the word of God, the fourth one, you remember that one, can you hear me now? And that was talking about in a relationship, listen, husbands, wives, learn to really hear each other, to really listen to each other, not just the facts. Us men are that way, hey, just give me the facts, just give me the facts. I've said it many times, my wife, she would be trying to tell me uh, something like, uh, from her heart, and I'd say, okay, stop, that's good, I, here's how you fix it, ABC, one, two, three, problem solved. She wasn't wanting the problem solved. She just wanted to be heard. And if we don't take the time to really hear someone, whether it's our spouse, whether it's a friend, whether it's one of our children, if they don't feel like they're being heard, then eventually they will make a statement in such a way such as that there is an, they are undeniably heard. For instance, a, a child taking their own life. They've been crying out for help. Some of the things we see them do, they do because they're hurt. Some of the things we think, boy, that, they're strange. 
they're, they're doing things because they're hurt, they're confused, they're trying to find their way. Sometimes it's a plea for, hey, look, I, I need some help over here. And they'll take their life and basically they're saying, well, can you hear me now? Sometimes a spouse, a husband or wife will walk out and say, well, that's it, I'm done. Can you hear me now? So take the time to listen to what they're saying and, and, and give them a hearing. The, anybody remember the next one, number five? Get your, get your feet dirty. Remember that lady in the book of Song of Solomon? The husband came knocking on the door. He'd been at work, and she said, oh, I've gotten in bed. I've already taken my coat off. How am I going to put it back on? If I get out of bed now, I'm going to get my feet dirty. And he couldn't get in, so he gave up, and he walked off. Then she said, oh, man, I should have let him in. She goes to the door. He's no longer there. She missed that opportunity to spend time with her husband. In our relationships, we are going to have some incredible opportunities to invest in our spouse, to invest in our children. You're, look, you're going to get home. Who, somebody recently told me they, they got home, and, man, they were just so tired. They were dead tired. And their child said, hey, can we, can we throw a ball? Oh, man. Hey, can we go ride a bike? Can we go do something? Or the wife or the husband, one or the other, says, hey, can we do this? Can we sit down and talk? Man, you better seize those opportunities while you have them. Because you shut somebody off enough that is asking for an opportunity to, to spend some quality time with it, you shut them off long enough, and guess what? They'll stop asking. All right? So get your feet dirty. Do what's inconvenient sometimes in order to foster and nurture that relationship. So many marriages I see falling apart did not need to fall apart. It just didn't need to happen. If the problems would have been handled early, those problems could have been fixed. And invariably, somebody was crying, look, here, man, we are having a problem, and nobody heard them. And so now, now they're in a mess. We can fix these problems if we attack them early on. Last week, you remember last week? Be a bone breaker. That's right. And we looked at that verse where it says that the soft tongue breaketh the bones. The way we speak to somebody can break that which is most hardened, most resistant in them. A soft answer does what? Turns away wrath. Why do we feel that in our conversation, in our disagreement, we have to insult each other? We'll see tonight, when we get married, when we become what? We become one. That means any insult I hurl at somebody, I'm insulting myself. We're one. If that's my wife, to hurt my spouse is to hurt me in one way or another. So speak tenderly to each other. And you remember the words that we saw in the Song of Solomon where he would say to her, my love, my dove. Mrs. Worley, when referencing her husband, calls him what? Anybody know? Beloved. My beloved. I call my wife baby. I know it doesn't sound as poetic as beloved, but it carries the same thing in my heart. That's my baby. Speak tenderly. To break up the hard things in the relationship. Now, Matthew chapter 19, verses 3 through 9. Let's get through this here. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and they twain shall be what? One flesh. Now that word cleave, it means to adhere to like glue. All right? Wherefore, they are no more twain, but what? One flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put, away, uh, uh, put asunder. Now they go on to say, well, they say unto him, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and put a, a, her away? He saith unto them, now he said, well, look, if that's the case, if that was God's intention, then why did uh, he let Moses give this law where there could be a divorcement? 
and, and, and look what he says. Um, he saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, it was what? Not so. So that wasn't God's intent. God's intent were for a man and a woman to marry each other, be together for life. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. Now listen. Marriage is the most intimate of all human relationships. When I say intimate, I don't mean in the physical sense. I mean in the sense of the, the closest. It is supposed to be the closest of all relationships. He said, look, the man is going to leave his father and mother. He is going to cleave to his wife so much so that they become what? One flesh. Now look, he's going to cleave and become one. Uh, it's, it's sort of like super glue or gorilla glue. You, you glue something with that. And what happens is, is the chemical reaction, it's not just that it's sticky, it actually bonds the two pieces to become one. If you get Gorilla Glue or, or Super Glue and you glue two pieces of wood together and let it set real good and you try to pull it apart, guess what? There's going to be some tearing up of one or the other. All right? It'll never be the same again. The Bible says that when a man and a wife get married, they are to become one flesh. One. Okay? Not two, but, but one. There's this unity in this diversity. In Amos chapter 3, verse 3, the, uh, the Lord speaking here to the children of Israel in Amos, it says this, Can two walk together except they be agreed? He says, look, Israel, I want us to walk together, but... You're going the opposite direction. How can we walk together if we don't even agree? Now, the Bible says that we are to be one flesh when we're married, right? Uh, we are a team. We are supposed to walk together. My wife says it this way, I want us to be on the same page. Anybody ever told your husband or wife that? I want us to be on the same page. All right. Anybody? Look. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, a stupid man, okay? I'm just glad to be in the same chapter, okay? I think it's great we're in the same book, uh, in the same chapter. That's, but no, she wants to be on the same page. And by the way, that's scriptural. We ought to be. Now listen to this. In talking to the churches, Paul said this to the Corinthians, 1 first, first Corinthians 1.10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the Lord Jesus, by our Lord, blah, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. We also learn in Corinthians that the devil uses division to give himself a foothold in the church. Well, let me tell you something. He does the same thing in the home. Now, if it's God's desire for us to be one flesh and walk together in agreement, then we have got to protect ourselves from that division. Let me ask you, and, I, and give me some answers here. What are some things that cause divisions in the marital relationship? What's that? Some money. Well, that's what I have right here. Finances. Financial hardships can cause divisions, cause uh, uh, resentments. Man not taking care of his family. Men, you got to work, take care of your family. If you don't take care of your family, the Bible says you're worse than an infidel. An infidel is someone who denies Jesus Christ. What's something else that causes uh, divisions? Health issues can, yeah. What's something else? What's that? Boy, man, y'all, y'all got, y'all been looking at my notes, or y'all have a lot of problems. I'm not sure what you did. Children can actually cause divisions. And by the way, that's not the child's fault, even when they're playing one against the other. That's just what kids do. It's our fault when we let them cause division. When the mom says to the dad, oh, you wouldn't believe what he did today while you were at work. And dad says, I'll handle it. And he goes in there and says, son, you're about to be punished. And the mama comes in, no, don't touch my little baby. Okay. So let the children come between us. Uh, what else is something else? What's something else that causes division? 
What's that? Line, okay, we're going to class, I'm going to paint that with a broader stroke. We're going to say sin, okay? Whether that's line that breaks trust and causes a trust issue, whether that's uh, um, anything like that, sin can cause a lot of division. And tragedy, we could name that with physical ailments. Tragedy can cause division. So listen to this. Matthew 19, 6, okay? Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. The most intimate of relationships, that of a husband and wife. If that relationship is that important, you better mark it down that the devil and the world are going to try to destroy it. When a young couple gets married, a lot of times they think, and I've heard some be told, oh, it's all going to be fine. I, I knew of a young couple that got married. Before they got married, they fussed with each other. They fought like cats and dogs. And here was the counsel that was given to them as they were getting ready to graduate college. Listen, just go ahead and get married. Y'all can work that out later. They were graduating from a Christian college. That is stupid, okay? Well, just get married. You can work all that out later. No, 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 no. If it is this important a relationship, then we have got to take extra measures to protect this relationship. Finances. I'm just going to give you a couple brief points here. No way I can cover it all. 1 Timothy 6, 8 says this, having there, And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. Okay, number one, work. Number two, be content to live a simple life. We can get so caught up in chasing all these fancy things. And by the way, nothing wrong with having something nice if you can afford something nice. But there is something wrong when you get something nice and you become a slave to it. Do you understand what I mean by that? You get something, you, you go into debt for something, and all of a sudden now I'm a slave to it, and now I can't even enjoy it because I'm having to work so hard just to pay for the thing. Learn to be content. Look, as long as you have Jesus, that's really all you need. If you have your family on top of that, what else do you need? As long as I have it, listen, that boat's going to break down. It, there's a chance it's going to sink. That truck's going to break down. My gun is, is not going to shoot one day, but my family that God gave me, well, I better keep them close. Learn to be content. Children. It's another area of division. Let me remind you, the Word of God says that the husband and wife are one flesh. The children are a product of that flesh. There are moms, and listen, I, I, I don't understand, ladies. I'll, I'll just be honest. I don't understand because I, I didn't carry a single one of my children within my womb for nine months and nourish them from my own body. I didn't go through the jaws of death to bring them in this world. Although with the birth of our second one during labor, my legs did hurt. And I told my wife at one point while she's in the throes of labor, I'm standing there, I said, hey, Dana, I'm going to have to sit down for just a minute. My legs hurt. And I sat down, and holy smoke, the stink eye that she gave me. The gaze of death, Medusa, had nothing on that. And she looked at me, and I stopped and said, you know what? I feel fine. I'm, I'm sorry, Dana. I don't know what I was thinking. I'm feeling good right now. So, ladies, I, us men will never understand, quite understand. Though we love our children more than life itself, we won't understand the bond you have with your children. There's no way we can. We haven't been through that, okay? However, the Lord says you and your husband are the one flesh. The children are a product of that flesh, but they're not one flesh with the parents. You follow what I'm saying? Protect that. Don't let finances, don't let children come between you. 
when that starts to happen, address the problem immediately. Go get counsel from somebody. Don't think, well, here's what I was taught to do, so I'm going to keep my mouth shut, and it'll all work its way out. No, it don't. You ever had a flat tire? You cannot ride on that flat tire until it inflates. Well, if I just go long enough, it's going to be okay. No, no, no. It's going to get worse. You're going to be riding on the rim before long. When there's a problem, address the problem. Here's one that causes division. We didn't mention a minute ago. Oh, it could come under sin, I guess. Selfishness. When we become envious of the other person or we become controlling of the other person. There's no room in the marriage for that. Look, if we are one flesh and and we're supposed to submit to each other and, sir, we're supposed to love the wife as Christ loved the church and gave uh, gave himself for it and and ladies are supposed to to reverence the husband, there's no room for selfishness. The moment, the moment we start focusing on our needs is the moment we've set ourselves up for some hurt. Our goal is to focus on the other's needs. Now, the other may need to understand that you do have some needs. All right? I understand that. Control. We see this, this in, um, with David's wife, Michael, at one point. Remember, they were bringing back the Ark of the Covenant. You remember that? And they're playing the music. And David, he lost points on his Baptist card. He was dancing. The Bible says he was dancing with all his might. Now, I don't know what moves they used back then. I I can picture him jumping, leaping, spinning around. But the Bible says in 1 Chronicles 15, 29, And it came to pass as the ark of the covenant of the Lord came to the city of David, that Michael, the daughter of Saul, looking out of the window, saw King David dancing and playing. Now listen to this. And she despised him in her heart. Michael had grown up the daughter of, of the king. There was a, an air about royalty. You, you know, you've seen royalty on the TV or whatever, and they, they have this, they, they, they wave in funny ways. I, I don't know how they do it. But there's this air about them. There's this mystique about them. And David, in his praise for the Lord, he humbled himself and he said, you know what? It's not about me at all. It's all about the Lord. And he rejoiced and danced for the Lord with all his might. He played. He was having a good time. Listen to 2 Samuel 6, 20 through 23. Then David returned to bless his household. And Michael, now he's getting ready, fellas. You ever, you'll, you'll understand, right? When you face the wrath. And Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today, who uncovered himself uh, today in the eyes of of the handmaids of his servants as one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncovered themselves. Oh, king! She got all sarcastic. Oh, boy, you sure were glorious today, king. Dancing out around there as one of those vain fellows, one of those people that lack honor, one of the lesser of our kingdom, dancing around and rejoicing. Oh, my goodness, you made an embarrassment doing that in front of your your servants and these other ladies. Listen to what David said. And David said unto Michael, it was before the Lord, which chose me before thy father and before all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of, of the Lord over Israel, Therefore will I play before the Lord, and I will be yet more vile than thus, and I, and will be base in my own sight. In other words, I realize I'm nothing. To, this royalty business is nothing compared to praising our God. And of the maidservants which thou hast spoken of, of them shall I be had in honor. 
Therefore, Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no children until the day of her death. This, this, this division because of her selfishness. Well, what will people think of me if my husband, the king, is acting that way? Who, who gives a flip? What does that matter? Let me tell you, one of the worst reasons you can discipline your children is because they embarrassed you. You don't discipline because they embarrassed you. You discipline because they've done something wrong. Does my, has my wife ever embarrassed me? I, I really can't think of it offhand. Probably so, but I mean, I can't think of a time. Have I embarrassed her? More than once, I'm sure. But we start focusing on what will people think of me, what will people, what will people say, and what will people do. There have been times my wife wanted to do something or was thinking about doing something, and she didn't think, think there was anything wrong. I don't think there's anything wrong, but being a pastor's wife is a peculiar position. You're always worried about what somebody will think. So my answer is always this. I don't care what they think. As long as, honey, if you're not doing anything wrong, don't worry. But, you know, these people, th this person and that person, that person, that one person may think this. Don't worry about that, Dana. Hey, Dana, don't worry about that. All right? Well, what will they think? Her, her thing as a pastor's wife is, well, what will people think of you? Well, if they think highly of me, they've got a wrong image of me anyways because there's really not much to me. I don't care what they think of me. I care what they think of my God. So I'm not going to let there be division over what we think somebody may think of us. Selfishness, get it under control. Stop thinking of yourself. Start thinking of your spouse. Sometimes tragedy. Think of Job's wife. Job lost his health. He lost all his wealth. He lost all ten children. And then she says this, Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. Now, we can be kind of hard on Job's wife, but you do realize she just lost ten children. And she's grieving. Sometimes a tragedy, something unexpected, can actually cause division in the marriage. Protect that. Determine before tra tragedy ever comes, listen, we are in it to win it here. We, we are going to be in this for the long haul. If we see a problem, let's nip it in the bud right off the bat. Let's, let's get a hold on this thing. Then there's sin. James 1.15, then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Death, that word death, it means, defined, it means separation. Physical death, our soul separating from our body. Spiritual death, uh, uh, our soul being separated from God in hell for eternity. Uh, uh, the death of a marriage, division between husband and wife, sin can cause that. Now, thank God we have a God with the power of resurrection that can bring dead things back to life. But sin can cause division. Now, here's the one point I, I, I hope we can get tonight. And let, look, I know we have people in here that, that have had broken marriages, and, and this is not preaching against you, okay? But we have some young people in here that don't we hope they never have to go through any of that pain? Don't we hope that they don't have to go through any heartache and that when they see trouble coming, that they know, hey, you know what? Here's trouble coming. There's about to be some division. Let's jump on getting this thing fixed right now. And sir, let me say, don't you have so much pride that you're not willing to reach out for help? If there's problem and your wife says, hey, can we get some counseling? Say, yes. You may think, well, that stuff don't work. Well, your resistance to trying to fix things isn't going to work either. And saying, hey, we can fix this, just give us more time, but you've been doing the same thing for six years, that's not going to fix it. So here's the principle for tonight. We, that word's plural, right, are one. Is that 
husband and wife, you are one. We're in this thing for the long haul. Extend that to any relationship, any meaningful relationship. So you have your children. Now, you and your children are not one flesh, but you are of the same flesh. And create that atmosphere in your home that, hey, you know what? Look, we are one family. And though we fall down and we have troubles and and, and, uh, problems arise and we make mistakes, listen, we will not let this family be divided for anything. Let's extend that relationship to church family. Remember what it said there, that there be no divisions among you. Let's determine, hey, we are one body of Christ. Let's not let anything, sin, tragedy, selfishness, anything come between us. Let's be one. It's an important relationship. The devil told, uh, or, or Jesus told Peter, he said, Peter, I've prayed for you. Because Satan has desired to sift you as wheat. He's desired to shred you. And let me say the devil's desire for our families is to shred them. And his desire for this church is to shred us, to tear us to pieces. Less determined and less purpose that, hey, we're in this thing for the long haul. We will not be divided. We will be one in Jesus Christ. And you keep that family intact. You protect it. Keep your, look, keep your guard up. Don't let any division come about at all. When you see it, nip it in the bud right away. Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving us. Lord, we get so busy in our day-to-day living that we, we let all kinds of things 